just as a side note, I believe the issue is, a, is, is that God uses everything that he makes as a visual aid. And that the husband, the Christian husband is a visual aid of Christ and the Christian wife is a visual aid of the church and the relationship that God wants and desires with the creation, really. And that these are roles that are being played out by those who are uh, submissive to God. If you're submissive to God, a husband who's submissive to God loves his wife like Christ loved the church. Now, you know, ladies, you may think that he does that because he's in love with you, but that won't sustain anybody through a marriage. It's got to be he does it for the Lord. And a wife, you know, works with the, within the boundaries of his headship with her husband because she does it for the Lord. She submits to the Lord. All submission is to the Lord. It's to the Lord. Okay? So I'm still working this out to some degree. But if you'll turn to Ephesians chapter 5 in your Bibles. Uh, see, is this working? Yeah, there we go. Ephesians 5. And we'll begin about verse 18. I'll tell you something about the book of Ephesians. And that is from chapter 1, verse 3 to chapter 4, verse 24, Paul teaches. It's all Paul explaining. He's a splainer. Like Lucy. Got some explaining to do. So, but from verse 425 to the end of the book, there are 30 imperative moods that are commands and admonishments. In other words, he does his teaching up to verse chapter 4, verse 24. Verse 22 through 24 is the most detailed explanation of transformation and spiritual growth that Paul provides. And at the end of that, he just begins to give admonishments. Do this, do this, don't do this, don't do that. Live like this, don't live like that, you know. And when he gets to verse 18, let's see. He gets to chapter 5, verse 18, if you'll go there with me. And that is... Well, you can go back to 15, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of God is, and do not get drunk. See, all of those are imperatives. See, walk wisely, don't walk foolishly, you know, be wise, not unwise, and, and you know, make the most of your time, these are imperatives. Don't be foolish, but understand the will of God. Verse 18, he says, and don't get drunk with wine, which is dissolution or addiction, but be filled with the Spirit. So this is our filling of the Holy Spirit passage, and it's a present active imperative. Consistently be filled, be in fellowship with the Spirit. But what's important for our discussion is that it's followed by five participles, I think they're all present participles, which give us the characteristics of what the filling of the Spirit should be like. These are the effects the filling of the Spirit should have on a believer. All right? So on your sheet, I've given these to you. If you want to, well, we can read it. It says, so be filled, don't be drunk, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another, there's your first one, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So when you're filled with the Spirit, you're communicating with each other in spiritual principles. See, true fellowship is not talking about football. That's all fine, but true fellowship is talking about spiritual principles. Then he says, singing and psalming. It says, speaking to other in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody. Those are two of the... So you got speaking, singing, and making melody in your heart. 
to the Lord. Now these probably dealing with the worship service. The fourth one is giving thanks. Can y'all see that? Giving thanks. So these are the things that happen when you're filled with the Spirit as a rule. And then he says, giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and then be submissive to one another in the fear of Christ. All right, so let me get another page here. Nope. So 518 is the filling of the Spirit. Then you got speaking and then singing, making melody, being grateful. And then the fifth one, I know you can't read that, but submitting to one another. One another. Okay? So, what does that mean to be submissive to one another? The five present participles indicate the impact of the filling of the Spirit on the believer's soul and his behaviors. The word submitting, hupotasso, to obey, to be influenced uh, to one another. Uh, these are other believers in the congregation. So what does it mean that we're to submit to one another? I mean, are we to obey one another? I mean, I, I have the power to come up and tell you to do something and you obey me? Is that what that means? I don't think so. I don't think that makes any sense. What I think it means is allowing other believers with spiritual gift, gifts and spiritual wisdom to influence your life. I think that when the Lord sends someone to you with a message or an encouragement or an admonishment or even a correction, that the Lord does that, you know. He uses spiritual gifts and spiritual believers to confront other people and encourage other people and help other people that when that happens in your life, you should, be, you should submit to the Lord in that, in that event, in that message. You should be open to be influenced by the body of Christ. We're parts of one another. Okay? That's what it means, in my opinion. It also means to be agreeable with one another, to not be contentious with one another, to not confront one another in a negative way. You know, of course, you've got sins. It's not even talking about sin. It's just talking about the way we relate to one another. Are you open to one another? to allow yourself to be influenced from the pulpit, from the, from the congregation? Are you open to that? That's what it means to be submissive. Now, so in verse 22, if you will read that with me, this is the big bad verse 22. Wives, be submissive to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, what's important here to me is the eraser. All right, look at there. How about that? So, all right, now what am I doing? I've got, I've got to do a line. Line there. How about that line? Okay. So, in verse 20... The fifth participle is submitting to one another. Okay? I mean, sorry, verse 21. And then verse 22, he says that the wives are to be submissive to their husbands. Well, here's what's really important. In verse 22, there is no verb submit. In fact, verse 22, wives submit to your husbands. All right? They borrow the verb from verse 21 and drop it down into verse 22. It's an assumption that the verse that the the principle of verse 21 is being applied to the wife. It's being applied to the wife. Whatever verse 21 is saying in the verb is being applied to the wife as to her husband. So, what is being said in verse 21? Is that is are we to obey one another in all things? Does one of us have authority over the other one? 
Not, the, not, not in this passage. Now, it's stronger than there is an authority, there is a headship idea here, no doubt. But I believe in verse 22, what it's saying is that the wife is to allow her husband to influence her, her spiritual life, her walk with the Lord, the same way she would any other spiritual gift, even more so, that she should let her husband be the spiritual leader in her life and allow him to influence her. Because, let's read on. He says, Wives, be submissive to your husbands, borrowing this verb from 21, because a man is the head, he's the kephale, the head of the woman, is also Christ is the head of the church. Now this word head can mean authority. It also means the source. If you go to 1 Corinthians 11, you discover what the head is. The head is the source and supply. Paul says the man didn't come, the man didn't come from the woman. The woman came from the man. The man, the kafale, the head in this divine creative order is the source of the woman. He also says the woman was not created for the, I mean, the man wasn't created for the woman, the woman created for the man. So he's given this guy this headship role in her life. So, Christian wives, well, let's go ahead and read, I'm sorry, let's see. Because a man is head of the woman, is Christ head of the church, himself the Savior of the body. But as the church is submissive to Christ, so also wives to their husbands in all things. Now, what does that mean? Because here's the husband's role. The husband, husband exercise complete authority over your wife. Is that what verse 25 says? You say, well, what authority does the husband have? What I can say so far is he's got the authority to love his wife like Christ loved the church. You've been authorized to be this leader in her life to love her the way Christ loves you. He goes on to say, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up on her behalf. For what purpose? See, here's the man's role, the same role that Christ has with the church, so that he might sanctify it, cleansing by the washing of the water of the word, that he might present the, to himself the church, the glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but he should be holy and blameless. So the so husbands should love their wife as their own bodies, because he lo who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. That's the man's authority. And what does that mean? So, Christian wives are to obey the Lord by allowing their husbands to influence their spiritual growth. And you say, well, I, look, I'm not married. Well, you just bypass the husband and you go straight to the Lord. So this, it doesn't matter if you have a husband. Or this, see, your submission is to the Lord, not to another human being. You submit to the Lord by working properly, being influenced and being led in this relationship. That's to the Lord. You do it for the Lord. So the Christian wives are to obey the Lord by allowing their husband to influence their spiritual growth because he represents Christ and the wife represents the church and God's primary visual aid of his love for us. See what God's creating. He says in 1 Corinthians 11 that God the Father is over God the Son. Now, how does God the Father exercise authority over God the Son? Does he order him around? He said, no, I have a will, and you get to choose whether you're going to obey it or not. Because Christ loved his Father and loved us, he obeyed him in every single way. Of course, he had no sin nature. He had a perfect soul. He had a perfect belief system. Perfect everything. There's no excuse for us, but we have, we're, we're born with this nature. So... So the father is the head over Christ, who is over the husband, who is over the wife, and the head equals source, supply, support, and spiritual influence. 
There's your four S's. Only when a woman becomes mature enough to love the Lord more than herself will she be able to give herself to Him, Christ, by allowing her flawed husband to play the role of Christ to her church in the visual aid. Listen, ladies, you're safe. See, if I don't get to it, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to run out of time, but Sarah, Peter's going to give us Sarah. And Sarah, you know, this was not, you know, this was not when she was Sarah. She'd have never done it as Sarah. But Abimelech took her. And Abraham didn't, didn't disagree. I think maybe Abraham was maybe happy about that because she couldn't have kids. Couldn't have a son. I don't know. I'm speculating. But what did Sarah do? She trusted the Lord for her safety, for her security, for her future. She'd been taken from Abraham. She didn't know whether she'd ever see him again. And Abimelech had her, and of course God intervened, but Sarah was peaceful. We'll see it in a minute. But she trusted the Lord, not her husband. See, it's good to trust. See, here's one of the, here's one of the misunderstandings, because we're so human, and we're so caught up in the human world. You don't, I talked to, we've done, well, Rhonda and I have done many marriage counseling. I've done more than her myself, but the women think, they say, if my husband was more the man he's supposed to be, it would be easier for me to follow him, to submit to him, or whatever that means. Ladies, that's not the right reason to do it. You don't do it because the man is the man, is a, is a great man. If you get a great man, that's a icing on the cake. You do it for the Lord. That's when it's genuine. Husbands love your wife like Christ loved the church. Why? Because she's so wonderful? Maybe she is. Maybe she's not. You do it for the Lord either way. This is about the spiritual world. These commands and these issues, see, he's going to tell you in chapter 5, he said, I'm not even really talking about marriage. I'm talking about Christ and the church. This is the spiritual world. This is, look, look at verse 30, because we are members of his body. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall leave, cleave unto his wife. The two shall become one flesh. He said, the mystery is great, but I'm talking about, I'm talking about Christ and the church. Not really talking about marriage. I am, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So, I know this is a little confusing. It's confusing to me, but when a woman becomes mature enough to love the Lord more than herself, she, she does this submission. She allows this headship in her life to influence her in her walk, in her direction, her geographics, her life. Because she does it for the Lord. The Lord told her to. Why else would you do it? I mean, I've got the most wonderful husband. Great. I don't hear that a lot. To be quite honest with you, I don't hear that a lot. Of course, I don't get marriage counseling when people are really, really happy. You know, they don't come in and go, man, we want to share. Wouldn't that be nice? Get Just get a day full of those, but... They're all, they're all at each other. And nobody understands. See, and they're at each other about personal things because they're disappointed in what they've gotten out of their marriage. It's me. What am I getting out of my marriage? I'm not getting what I bargained for. This is why I wasn't, this was not why I got into this, to get all this. So they're, who are they thinking about? Me, 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 me. See, Christian marriage is a step beyond me. It's not about me, even me. It meets many needs in my life. It's a wonderful human institution. Christian marriage is about creating a visual aid of Christ in the church. You know, you know who it's for? You know what Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 says? 
that the angels are watching the church. Angels. You say, well, look, I'm not married. Yes, you are. You know who you're married to? Jesus Christ. Are you engaged? When in the Jewish custom, was same as being married. I mean, listen, who are, you, who are you committing adultery with? Television? You know? Golf? <laughs> that used to be my idol, was golf. Until he gave me a backache. And he said, play golf now, son. See how that works. All right. The Christian wife's marital submission has a receptive side where she allows her believing husband's spiritual life and leadership to influence her own spiritual walk. It's allowing yourself to be influenced. Listen, nobody, even from a pulpit, has any authority over you except for their credibility from their teaching and the influence they have of their own walk. Authority in the spiritual realm comes from influence because you allow yourself to be influenced. It's the same with a man and woman. No man is able to enforce. I mean, what are you going to do, guys? Beat her up? You know, tie her to the bed or force her to do this? Of course not. That's not the plan. You know, and you think, well, I'm going to be such a great husband that she won't have any, ch I mean, it'll just, it'll just be natural for her to follow me. Well, I think if you're very, very compatible and of certain personality types, that that's possible. But it's very rare. And it's not the point. The point about Christian marriage is not about you personally. It's about your visual aid of Christ in the church. It's about you obeying the Lord. It's also about forming character. Because as you learn to do this for the Lord, I mean, in marriage, you get to these places where it's like, I don't know if we can continue. This is just difficult. This is difficult and hard. And that's when you go to the Lord and go, what do I do? He said, well, what did I tell you to do? I don't know, Lord. He said, yeah, you do. Go read your Bible. Love your wife like Christ loved the church. Does he abandon you? No. Absolutely not. You stick with it. Well, I don't know that she wants to. Doesn't matter. You do your part. You do your part. To her, yeah, let this guy be your leader. But well, I don't like him. I don't enjoy him. I don't, I'm not in love with him. How about me? You love me? How about doing it for me? See, it's about doing it for the Lord. It's not about doing it because you got this great husband or this great wife. It's about doing it for the Lord. We have, listen, listen to me, please. For us to have an effective Christian ministry, we have to stop thinking that everything's about our human experience here. Getting God to align himself with our experience here. To give us what we want. To make things work well for us. And that's nothing wrong with wanting that and getting that. But it's not the point. The point is we're here for him. And often that's going to require us to go through suffering, persecution, difficulties. That's coming to a theater near you. It's coming. And then I never thought I'd see it in my lifetime, but I think we will. And you've got to be willing. Are you willing to let go of your agenda to stand up for the Lord? So that's what makes marriage profitable for the Lord is when you do what you you do your part for the Lord, not just because you're loving the other person in a personal way. The command is agape. All right. The wife allows herself to be influenced by the spiritual leadership and common sense of her husband, of her believing husband, so they're both growing into an ongoing walk with the Lord. Like Christ, the husband's mission is to provide an environment of unconditional love that supports her at every turn in her spiritual growth. 
That's his job. See, everything that's said about Christ that we're to be like husbands is about our growth. Standing before the great wife, I mean, standing before the judgment seat of Christ, purified. This means forgiving her when she fails in her part of the marriage. And that's probably the biggest part of marriage, in my opinion, is forgiveness. Because nobody meets up the standard. Nobody is consistent with it. Everybody gets selfish and thinks about me, feels sorry for themselves because they don't get what they want, get angry with the other person, try to manipulate. You know, the husband, he can't get his wife to go along with him, so he gets overbearing. When that, when that blows up in his face, which it always does, then he gets passive, trying to hang on to things. You know, and so she gets fearful. Peter says the woman's challenge is fearfulness. She gets fearful and tries to control everything. He's like, no, no, because he's stubborn. And forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. Listen, you not arrived. One of the one of the things that I see all the time is people wanting to be considered as if they are already as, as, as they are supposed to be. They're already arrived. Any, any discussion of the way that you might be coming up short, you're like, why are you criticizing me? Well, it's because your behavior is making it difficult in our relationship. And that's the way all of us are as sinners with old man beliefs that we, we operate wrongly and we we hurt our partner. And so the way that you grow together is these conflicts that come up, you use them. See, the title of my marriage series is Using Conflict to Develop Compatibility. You use it. You use your differences to see what's different between you and find a way to compromise. You use your adversities or conflicts to see yourself where you're coming up short. That's the biggest part of marriage is a mirror. So you use these conflicts as an opportunity to take the Word of God and apply them to your life and honor the Lord. This, the, listen, these conflicts in marriage and in relationships are the bomb. They're your friend. You use them, you go, okay, you use them to grow and, and grow better yourself. I mean, there's nothing better in your life than to be able to see where you're not operating properly in your relationships. You know why that's so wonderful? Because you can change it and you become, become more like Christ. And not only for this other person, but for yourself. It's a wonderful gift to be in conflict with someone else. If you understand it, if you understand that God's allowed it to teach you things, to mold you, see, this is what marriage needs. Marriage needs to understand that conflict is not the end. Oh, no, we're, gonna, we're coming to the end because there's conflict. There's going to be conflict, tons of conflict. You know, after about 20 years, you just get so tired of trying to work it out, you just give up. But, you know, you become like a smooth rock on the bottom of the stream. And, and, and everything gets better because you quit fussing about everything. All right. The Christian wife is edified as she allows her believing, growing husband to nurture her and lead her in the Lord. Christian husbands find fulfillment in his wife's openness to him. Listen, guys, when you're overbearing, when you're harsh, bitter, angry, she's not going to be open. She's going to shut down. So if you're in a relationship with someone who's shut down, either somebody in the past has hurt that and created this wall, or it's you, and you can't fix it, but the Lord can. And if this girl that you're with is willing to open her heart to the Lord and forgive and start over, then you can regroup and begin moving again. And that's the, that's the desire. It's not your, it's not your place to boss her around. It's not a bossing around deal. You know, years ago, 
when I first came here, I was 26. And I've been here a couple of years or so, and I, you know, I remember being at a get together with a bunch of, of the ladies that were older than me, you know, and asking them sincerely, honestly, what are the, what's the deal about submission? Because I don't really see anybody doing it the way I had been taught. And they all just kind of winked and laughed at me like, yeah, right. Am I wrong? And I just thought, well, these are spiritual women, godly women. And they don't, they don't look at it that way. They think it's a joke. Well, I don't think it was, I don't think that the way I learned it, I'm not going to say the way Ron taught it or anybody, I, the way I learned it was the man supposed to be in charge. And I don't find that in the Bible. I don't find anywhere in the Bible where the man is told to be in charge. You know who the authority issues addressed to? The woman, the wife. Every time it's addressed to her. She's the one that has to observe that because of her love for the Lord. She does it for the Lord, not for this man. Now she may do it for him too, and that's a sweet thing. But it it at the at the at the bottom line, she goes back to the Lord and he says, Do what I told you. If you'll do that, then you and I are going to be good, no matter what happens. Same with the man. You give this woman the love, the environment of, of freedom for her to choose. So that's what Christ does with us. See, I'm supposed to love my wife like Christ loved the church. What does he do? He gives us promises and principles and he gives us opportunities and he gives us an environment where no matter how much I fail, he picks me up. No matter how bad I do, he picks me up and puts me back in, in the game. He forgives me and cleanses me and we start all over every time. That's the husband's environment. He creates this environment for his wife to grow into this relationship with the Lord. He's encouraging her, encouraging her, encouraging her. He loves her like Christ loves him. So, secondly, and I'll, you know, i got a little bit. There's another aspect. There's a receiving side to be influenced by her believing husband. But there's also an expressive side where the wife's submission purposely, listen to me, purposely, intentionally reveals God's love and grace to her husband through the inner beauty of her tranquil, at-rest soul. That means you got to be at rest, like Sarah. Sarah was at rest. God's got it. Doesn't matter what Abraham does, God's got it. I mean, was Abraham, I don't even know, I can't judge Abraham. I'm just going to say that if somebody comes along and wants to take my wife, it's like the old joke, the, <laughs> the state trooper was behind the man and he kept running and running. Finally, the state trooper caught him. And uh, he said, why did you run? He said, well, last week my wife ran off with the state trooper and I thought you were trying to catch me to give her back. So, oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's Abraham. That's Abraham. So, listen to Peter. 1 Peter 3, 6. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. We've got just another minute or two. I want to show you the other side of submission. This is an expressive side. See, listen. This relationship is... It's, it's, it's a mutually edifying relationship. You edify one another back and forth, back and forth. It's a beautiful system. So 1 Peter 3, he talks about in the same way, and he's referring to, the, there's five different uses of hupotasso in 1 Peter. 
it's really kind of the outline of the book, about servants and masters, about Christ enduring un unjust suffering, uh, about submitting to elders, that type of thing, submitting to the government. And then in the same way, the wives be submissive to your husband, to your own husband, so that if any of them are disobedient or unpersuaded by God's word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. So, a Christian wife married to an unbelieving husband, one who's unpersuaded by the word, the goal is to win him to be saved. And, and, and for him to grow, in, if he is saved and yet not growing, to help him get connected with the Lord to grow. This mission is more important than what she gets personally from him. And if you're a husband in the same kind of situation with an unbelieving wife, your mission to lead her to the Lord is more important than what you're getting personally out of it. Of course, that's only if you love the Lord more than you. As this woman, this, un, this believing wife with an unbelieving husband or unpersuaded husband trusts and lives for the Lord, her faith and in, in the reality of Christ in her life as evidence through her spiritual and respectful behavior are observed by him, revealing the reality of Christ to him. She does this intentionally. He's out of line. He's not where he should be. She's going to reveal Christ to him by her inner peace, her tranquility of soul because of her trust in the Lord. See, this, she's, she's, she doesn't fight. She doesn't confront. She doesn't use words, he said. Even doesn't even use words. She uses her inner peace. Nothing more beautiful in a woman than inner peace. A woman's inner beauty comes from her confidence that God will take care of her and her children even if her foolish husband makes many leadership decisions, foolish decisions. This is Sarah and Abraham. Her in God, no matter the circumstances, gives her inner peace and tranquility, even in adversity and conflict, so that while her unbelieving husband is stressed, she is calm and supportive sharing her strength. What she's not is, is second-guessing all of his decisions, criticizing him for, her, for his mistakes. She's supportive of the guy with her own... You know why? Because she's got... God's, God's got the net under them, and she knows it, and she's relaxed, and she can trust the Lord, and that becomes a ministry to the husband. For a healthy, growing Christian wife, submission is more than dutiful compliance with her husband's wishes. It is her sharing her inner tranquility to edify him. And this creates the image of Christ in the church. So, hope that's helpful to you. It's a little different look at submission and how the, this relationship works. You know, the way I taught it is the husband decides everything and the wife just goes along with it and... Uh, uh, and that's worked really well in my life. <laughs> Listen, here's what I believe, I've come to believe about this, is that because, it, because it's been considered incorrectly, because the man has been told that he's supposed to be in charge of everything and responsible for everything, he feels like he has to push hard to make that happen. You know, uh, he has to keep his household in order. And so he has to use, he has to be overbearing to make that happen. And all that does is just confuse. It gets everything all tangled up because that's not the job. He's not supposed to be in charge of everything or in control of everything. He's supposed to love his wife like Christ loves the church. Let her choose for herself. Father, I just pray that these principles... Uh, can be understood and applied in our life in some way. To those that aren't married, Father, I pray that you give them application and other relationships in their life to pastors or to other spiritual gifts. And 
to the people in their life that they should be listening to and be influenced by. And for wives, Father, I just pray that they could learn to let their husbands lead and, and be the head of the house, head of the home and the marriage. And, uh, and, and these principles to begin to foster a better relationship among, among the married couples and that we could have stronger families and stronger families make a stronger nation and a stronger church. Because, Father, we desperately need to, we need a revival. And I'm just grateful. I'm grateful for Willie and for being part of his ministry. You know, for my wife, who is also part of it and a big part of it, and, and for being able to be part of this resurgence of salvations up in the 70s now, Father. Maybe more. They come, they're dropping out of the sky. So we, I pray for a fellow named Jonathan that got saved just the other day and got baptized. I just pray for his spiritual growth. And anyway, we love you, Father. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen.